A notable crime novelist from Chicago by the name of Eugene Izzy is found deceased on Saturday the 7th of December 1996. He's found hanging out of the window of his 14th floor office wearing a bulletproof vest with brass knuckles, mace, and a disc containing an unfinished manuscript in his pockets. The police officially ruled the death to have been that of a suicide, but many speculate that something far more sinister had occurred. You see, the scene of his death had been very similar to one described in the unfinished manuscripts that would ultimately go on to be published in 1998. Had Eugene unknowingly written the exact details of how he would meet his tragic end? Did he predict his own death, or was this just a coincidence? All that, and more, coming right up. People say Kid Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Eugene John Izzy Jr. was born on Monday the 23rd of March 1953 in Chicago, Illinois. Now, not all too much is known about his childhood, but there are a few accounts that he himself later shared about what it was like for him growing up. In 1991, which was five years before his death, Eugene wrote that he had a bad family life. According to the Chicago Tribune, he said, quote, My earliest memories of my childhood were of my father beating up my mother. This turbulent home life negatively affected him in several ways and had an impact on his performance at school. Several accounts note that he had been a child that was prone to being in trouble and that that he did not do well within the school environments. Eugene would eventually drop out of high school, choosing instead to enlist in the US Army. While enlisted, he achieved a high school equivalency degree and did well within the environment that the Army had provided him with. And when Eugene decided to quit the military and return to Chicago, he didn't waste any time before getting back to work. He works a job at the steel mills on the southern side of Chicago, which is a very difficult and hard job. Eugene ultimately got married and even had children, though his mental health had begun to decline. And so he turned to alcohol in order to self-medicate, and slowly his life unraveled. It had been during this time that Eugene had begun to write. Initially, he wrote as a form of self-therapy, allowing himself to briefly escape from the ongoings of his daily life and into a story. During periodic layoffs at the steel mills, he would dedicate himself to writing, and eventually he began to crawl back out of the hole that he'd fallen into. At first, Eugene's stories weren't very good, at least that's what he would state during a talk give later on in his life. These early stories had been, quote, parodies, of his life, where his characters would go through similar situations and experiences as him. It was effectively vent writing. But Eugene wanted to be more, and so he quickly changed the tune of his writing. He evolved his stories from being self-pitying to being about the lives of others. He started to write tales based off of the people in the steel mill neighbourhoods, such as the ones in which he'd grown up in. Eugene's hard work resulted in him mending his relationship with his wife and finally writing a book that somebody wanted to publish. After a few years of rejections, his book The Take was published by St. Martin's Press in 1987. Eugene continued to write after his first publication, producing Bad Guy, and The Eighth Victim, both of which were published in 1988. Under his own name, he'd publish 15 crime novels with various different publishing houses. They were The Take in 87, Bad Guys in 88, The Eighth Victim in 88, The Booster in 89, King of the Hustlers in 89, The Prime Role in 1990, Invasions also in 1990, Prowlers in 91, Tribal Secrets in 92, Tony's Justice in 93, Bulletin from the Streets in 95, 
Players in 96, The Criminalist in 98, and Safe Harbor in 99. Eugene would also take up a pseudonym, Nick Giattano, under which he would publish three more novels, Special Victims in 94, Mr. X in 95, and Jaded in 96, with the last one, Jaded, being published in the UK under the name Spent Force in that same year. The books, The Criminalist and Safe Harbor, were released in 98 and 99 respectively, and they both were put out after Eugene's death, using manuscripts that were mostly completed at the time. Through his writings, Eugene had become quite successful, and had finally thought himself worthy of calling himself a true author. He had become notable within the crime genre, though he wasn't big on publicity. Eugene would eventually do book signings in the early 1990s, and lived comfortably enough to have an office with his new publishing company, Avon Books, which he'd signed with less than a year beforehand. This publishing company, Avon Books, had a building located at 4 Michigan Avenue, right in the heart of Chicago, next to what is now the area where the cloud gate shiny bean thing that everyone goes to Chicago to see for some reason resides. Specifically, the publishing house resided at room 1418 of that building. In the weeks leading up to the 7th of December 1996, Eugene had grown fairly paranoid. He had joked at a book signing in 1991 that his wife had all Always called him a paranoid person, so from the outside this might not have looked too strange. However, the truth was far from it. Eugene was in the process of writing a book, and had been spending a lot of time at the office. So much time, in fact, that he'd even started sleeping there at night. Now this alone wouldn't be too strange, however, there had been one more factor that did make this stand out. Eugene had been carrying a .38mm pistol with him at all times. Though Eugene was paranoid, and that paranoia hadn't been a secret, the looming presence of a gun had been a recent addition that several people who spoke with him regularly took notice of. Rumours began to circulate around that he was doing some deep and dangerous research for an upcoming novel. This wasn't all too uncommon for Eugene, as he'd put himself in somewhat dangerous situations before in order to gather information on crime to make his books more interesting, though people felt that this recent research had been more dangerous than usual. His upcoming book had been about a militia in Illinois, and this militia had affected effectively been just aggressive white supremacists who enjoyed beating up minorities. As Eugene's paranoia about his safety quietly manifested and grew, he had no idea that he had a genuine right to have been scared. Whether that be of himself or of others, is still questioned to this day. Now it is important to note that the details surrounding the death of Eugene have only come from context clues found at the scene of his death. On the morning of Saturday the 7th of December 1996, Eugene Izzy was found dead at the office building on Michigan Avenue. A man was walking down the streets when he looked up at the high-rise building and noticed something hanging out of one of the windows a person. When the police arrived at the door to his office on the 14th floor, it was found to have been locked. The officers broke down the door and immediately began to investigate the scene in front of them. Eugene had been found with a rope tied around his neck in a noose, with the other end secured to one of the legs of his desk. After his body had been recovered and lowered to the room below the window that Eugene had been hanging out of, the police uncovered several strange facts. Firstly, Eugene had been wearing a bulletproof vest. Inside the pockets of his coat and trousers, there had been a few even stranger items, including a pair of brass knuckles, a spray can of mace, a transcript of a voicemail that he'd received, a computer disc, his wallet, and $481 in cash, which is now worth $922 or £734. Inside Eugene's office, the police found a gun lying on the floor of the room, the still fully loaded .38 caliber pistol that Eugene had been carrying with him in the weeks prior. These seemingly random items were collected as evidence, and they would be explored deeply Deeper later on. Eugene's remains were identified by his ID found in his wallet, and the police subsequently contacted his family. The incident was listed as a quote, death investigation, and the authorities began trying to figure out what exactly had happened behind the locked door in room 1418. Now, it's important to note that we don't have the dates for the events that took place during the investigation that followed, but it seems clear that this investigation in this case had been rocky. There were very little leads to go off of, and more importantly, the police weren't even sure that a crime had even been committed in the first place. The transcript of the voicemail found in Eugene's pocket was analysed, and the call that had come in and had been recorded by the machine was defined by the police as quote threatening, 
but no direct copy of this transcript could be found in my research. Though it is reported in several places that the voicemail had been played for several people by Eugene, and a paraphrase of it goes along these lines. A woman calls Eugene and tells him that his infiltration of, quote, the Indiana militia has been discovered. She then says that he's been, quote, tried by a kangaroo court and sentenced to die by a flaming rope. This is likely not a direct quote from the call recording, but all places and people who've recounted the tale have used the term flaming rope. Another piece of evidence analysed was the computer disc. The investigators managed to gain access to the computer in Eugene's office and looked into the disc's contents. And what they found was an 800 or so long paged manuscript for an unfinished crime novel. When the detectives read the manuscript, they uncovered something that they hadn't been expecting at all a scene in the novel that had been almost identical to Eugene's death. In the story, the main character is hung by the neck outside of a window by the bad guys, but he survives. The character uses the rope around his neck to hoist himself back up and into the room before grabbing his gun and shooting them. Eugene had written the scene of his very own death. They also noted that the main character of the story was strikingly similar to Eugene in appearance and personality, even down to some hobbies. One investigator even remarked that they felt that the only difference between Eugene and his character in the book was the name. The phone calls on Eugene's answering machine were traced, and the one which featured the woman threatening him was traced back to a payphone right outside of the office's building. The woman was never identified, but investigators began to suspect that she had actually been reading off a script of some sort. The last call made on the phone had been to one of his sons, and his son claims that his father Eugene had called to say that he had forgotten his keys and had asked him to bring them to the office. The son did so and told the investigators that his father had met him in the lobby, hugged him, and then said, quote, No matter what happens, I want you to know that I love you. On Wednesday the 15th of January 1997, over a month after his death, the police determined Eugene's death to have been a suicide. Now due to the strangeness of this case, many people have speculated about what had happened from the moment the news broke. Both the public and those who knew Eugene had their own ideas and opinions about what had happened to him, and several actually spoke out on those thoughts. In the 15th of December 1996 publication of the Chicago Tribune, the authors wrote, quote, the only prop missing from what otherwise could have passed for a crime thriller movie set, one officer noted, was the bottle of Jim Beam and the half-empty glass. This sentiment was shared as many publications and news sources discussed the possibility of Eugene's death being something other than suicide. One theory, and probably the most common theory, had been that Eugene was murdered. Those who believe this theory feel that it has something to do with the book that he was writing at the time, how else could the scene that he had written have been nearly identical to the real-life crime scene? This theory also cites the threatening voicemail and the paranoia that Eugene had been experiencing in the lead-up to his death. Many feel that the likelihood of an organised white supremacy group discovering his infiltration and his death cannot be unlinked. Though Eugene's family seemed to be okay with the official determination of what happened, several of his friends had not been okay with it. Fellow crime novelist and New York lawyer Andrew Vax said about the case, quote, you don't wrap yourself in a Kevlar vest and carry a handgun if you're relaxed about the environment around you. He was completely sane and dedicated to his craft, which happened to mean digging up dirt. Other friends claimed that Eugene had been in a state of fear of being hurt or killed and was desperate to protect himself, showing behaviour that was life-preserving rather than life-ending. Eugene's marriage had been going well and his two sons had also been doing well in school. Eugene was also on Zoloft at the time of his death and was receiving medical help for his diagnosed clinical depression. Because of these remarks from friends and due to the strangeness of the crime scene, publications as large as the New York Times and the Washington Post published theories that this incident had been a murder. The main string of the theory had been that Eugene had dug too far and had, by doing so, pissed off the wrong people. It speculates that the white supremacists had been angry that they'd been tricked and that their secrets and organisation were going to be used as the villains in a book, something that would bring more negative attention to their group of racist sacks of shit. It's thought within this theory that a group of these men banded together and killed Eugene 
hoping to make his death a spectacle. Though there are several things that this theory fails to explain. For starters, Eugene had been reported to have weighed around 220 pounds or 100 kilograms at the time of his death. He also had been around six foot tall and so was not an easy person to subdue for long enough to tie a noose around and throw from the window. Another issue was with the manuscript itself. How would the men who allegedly murdered him have read it? Though the disc containing the manuscript had been found in Eugene's remains, there'd been no proof of anyone other than Eugene accessing the computer. And on top of that, it doesn't make sense for them to have taken the time to access it, then put it back on Eugene's remains. For that part of the theory to be true, they'd have had to have subdued Eugene looked up the character and how they almost dies in the manuscripts, then carried on with tying the rope to both the desk and Eugene. It just doesn't seem probable. It also doesn't make sense that a killer would see a gun in the room and choose to kill someone with a rope instead. The last factor to take into account had been that the door to the office had been locked when the police and the firefighters had arrived, meaning that the perpetrators would have had to have locked the door on the way out of the office. The next most common theory, and the official theory, had been that Eugene had indeed ended his own life. Though the scene was weird overall, it's not impossible that Eugene had taken his own life. Despite the fact that some of his friends didn't accept this theory, his family members did, and I think that's something that isn't really credited enough within the other theories surrounding his death. Eugene had a past with petty crime, drug use, and alcoholism, which all related to a decline in his mental health, so it isn't impossible that, despite the Zoloft medication, he experienced a dip, and remembering that self-medicating didn't help, he wanted to end it. The police even began to theorise that the scripts that they felt the woman on the voicemail had read had been written by Eugene himself, perhaps even done as a favour or maybe as a paid gig. However, it would have been strange for him to end his own life when he was in the middle of a major book, and also perhaps even stranger to have done so after he'd received these threats, like the ones he'd got from this possibly fake woman who'd left the voicemail, but again, it's not impossible. It should be noted that writers do have, statistically, a higher chance of ending their own lives than other professions. In 2012, The Atlantic did a study that came to the conclusion that writers and other creatives were more likely to commit suicide than professions that were not creatively based. The last theory we're going to touch on in this case sounds somewhat stranger at first, but when it's fully examined, it seems to hold water. There are people who believe that Eugene's death had been caused by a freak accident. Now at first it sounds ridiculous that somebody could accidentally tie a noose around their neck and jump out of a 14th floor window, but there is some nuance to it, and when taken into consideration, it even matches up with some of the evidence found in his office. Firstly, it's important to remember that Eugene was known for doing deep, real-life research to gather details about situations in his books and to make his books seem more realistic. He'd gone as far as infiltrating a hate group to be able to more accurately describe the type of group for the book. He'd even been cited as testing somewhat dangerous stunts to ensure they were feasible. There was even a point where Eugene had gone out of his way to live on the streets for a week to more accurately write about a homeless character in a book. The theory is that Eugene decided that he wanted to test the feasibility of the rope climb scene that he had written in the book, and felt confident that it was doable. The gear he had on is also explained by this theory. He was scared that the men from the hate group would come and find him, and wanted to be able to protect himself if someone did come and tried to hurt him, just like the character in his book. And as for the manuscript being in his pocket, no one is really sure why that was there in any of the theories, but it does make sense that the similarity of the book scene and the scene of his death is similar in this theory, because he of all people would know about it, unlike in the murder theory. It would also explain the fact that the door to his office had been locked when first responders arrived. He simply would have locked the door for safety upon entering the office. Though it would be strange for someone to have enough confidence to hang themselves, the theory does point out that the fact that Eugene spent a few years in the army, where skills like climbing ropes are commonly taught. Eugene had kept up with his fitness after his time in the army and in the time leading up to his death, meaning that it's entirely plausible that he believed that he could pull his own weight back up without issue. He was known for working out by working with punching bags, practicing karate, and lifting weights, which might have made him more confident in his ability to perform a stunt like that. The timing with the call and other bits might have been a bit strange, but this wouldn't have been a departure from Eugene's usual risk-taking behavior. Reception of this theory was half and half, with one news person saying, quote, if he was practicing, he should have done it on the first floor. At the end of the day, we do not currently know the truth as to what happened to Eugene. The only potential confirmation would be from a note that had been missed that 
could be found, or if somebody came forward with information. Regardless, it seems that the mystery of the last moments of Eugene Izzy will, at least for the time being, remain obscure. Personally, I feel like the chances of it being a freak accident are higher than it having been a suicide or homicide. He was a physically capable man who had gone through military boot camp and kept up with his workouts. I'm sure that in his mind, he felt that if anyone could have climbed that rope, it would have been him. And as stated in the theory section, it would make the most sense out of all of them too. The likelihood of someone going in, reading the book, hanging him, leaving the gun on the ground and locking the door all in one evening doesn't make sense at all. The book was 800 pages long, it wouldn't have been reasonable or readable in one night even for the guy who wrote it, let alone someone with the intent to kill while their intended victim had been in the room. The suicide theory has some merits, but the way in which Eugene's death occurred has far too many strange factors, and it would have been an extremely convoluted way to have gone about it. Whatever the case, I feel like the threat he felt had been genuine, and the fear he felt and expressed had been due to something very real. I absolutely think that the hate group out in Indiana could have had some plan to kill him or had threatened him, but I just don't think they got that far. And while the murder plot absolutely made more sense than it being a suicide, there's still so many holes in the argument that I simply don't think anybody else had been in that office that night other than Eugene. Ultimately, I hope that his family have found peace and have been able to move on after Eugene passed, and that his family and friends have been able to accept that he was gone and carry on. But based on the articles I've read, I don't think for a second they've been able to. Many of his friends and fellow writers seem to believe that his death had been part of a bigger conspiracy that wanted more investigation than it got. Granted, I don't think the massively public theorising that took place in the newspapers and in the news broadcasts have helped either. It easily could have fueled further speculation about the quote real truth and aided in keeping them up at night about it. Whatever the case, I sincerely hope that he rests in peace. Thank you so much for watching this episode in my Curious Case True Crime series. If you want to see more videos like this, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and click the bell icon to be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video, which is every Sunday at 9pm UK time. If you prefer to listen to my videos, you can find uh, ev all of my videos are uploaded to Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts, just search uh, True Crime with Joshua Miles. You can listen to every episode in my Curious Case series in podcast form over there. You can find a link down below in the description. If you have a case that you want me to cover, then head on over to requestacase.com and send in your case request submissions there. And with all that being said, I will see you in the next case. What you guys can't see right now is the fact that my boyfriend is sat watching me do this and it is kind of embarrassing, I cannot lie. It's a bit embarrassing to talk to yourself in front of a camera like this.